and welcome to episode three of the Three Wise Men at WSN podcast. I am Miles Holiday. Danny Holbrook will be with us again next week. He is on vacation. We are welcomed to have these three guys with us. Mark Shine, the legendary announcer, Diamond Dave Bowen, and Nate the Nibbler Garlock uh, join us today, guys. How are you guys doing for episode three? I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> doing great, Miles. Yeah, I couldn't be more excited that the uh, nickname now continues to follow me in all aspects yeah. of everything we do, Miles. I couldn't be more happy about it. Well, fellas, we like to get every podcast uh, started with uh, the best thing that we saw all last week. Dave, what's the best thing that you saw? Well, I have a couple honorable mentions, go Miles. Ahead, buddy. I'd like to go with that first. So, first of all, volleyball. Marion Local coming back from being down 2-0 on Saturday against OG. It's a game we had on WOSN, Garrett C. Wright and myself. And it was just a great comeback. Marion Local's back was against the wall, and they battled against a very good OG team. I got to give OG some props. They are three and five, and you're thinking, oh, what's going to happen here? They're below 500. They are the best three and five team in the state of Ohio. Their five losses are to St. Henry twice, Coldwater Lipsick, and Marion Local. Combined record for those four programs, 30 and one Ooh. right now. So, uh, Maddie. Hewerman, uh, she's doing a great job at um, OG, and she's going to get them rolling. They're going to get some wins. They're going to be a formidable opponent in the WBL. My second honorable mention, both QBs in the LCC Delta St. John's game, both Drew Boggs and Brady Parker, they really did a good job of managing the game, putting their team in a position to win, and that's, that's a game that went down to the wire. A great, great effort by both teams, and their quarterbacks were right there leading both squads. But the, the player that I want to mention that I really saw as being the best last week was Raya Busher, the libero for St. Henry. St. Henry goes into New Bremen last Thursday night, the Nest, and they win 3-0. to zero. That is unheard of. Right. The two-time defending state champions, New Bremen. Raya Busher, she was just that rock for St. Henry. Whenever St. Henry was wobbling just a little bit, it seemed like she had a great dig or she had a great pass on serve receive that went up to Teeman and then full in camp with a slam and St. Henry would have their legs back under him. New Bremen had no answer. It sounds like some an unbelievable volleyball. This area is really blessed with volleyball, isn't it? We really are. And it's it's obviously the Mac and then it filters over to Lima Land a little bit, but they just reload and replace and reload and it's just it's really fun to watch every every year. Nate, what about you? Best thing you saw this week? Yeah, so it's a little bit of a, a, a cheap way out, considering we're going to have Coach Wireman on here <laughs> in a little bit. But, um, you know, it really has been the start that the Shawnee Indians have been um, on to begin this season. 0-10 last year, I mean, th there's been so much talk about that. You know, they, they had to go through a change of head coach last year, late into the season, really got off to a rough start. A couple of games that I think they felt like they let get away from them led to that 0-10 start. Now another turnover in coaching staff and a, a total new game plan and a new system. And those kids, they've embraced it. It's a different mentality. You can see it when you watch mm -hmm. them play. It's not – even though most of those kids – that are out there were part of what they did last year. It's right. they're not the same. It, the mentality's different. The effort, the energy, everything is different with them, and you can tell because it's led to wins. Mm -hmm. And you know they got another tough one this weekend against Bath that we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. But I mean they they are setting themselves up for a complete turnaround in less than a year. You know, and a couple of more wins in this WBL, oh, yeah. and there's some teams that they can compete with. Right. This is a team mm -hmm. that could very easily find themselves in the playoffs. They, they you talk about. You know, guys who had, had success for those kids when they were in middle school won a state championship in middle school track as a relay team. Yeah. And they've had success. They've got speed. They've got some talent. Coach did a nice job with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Hey, they get a win on Friday. Uh, they can maybe be undefeated uh, with a showdown with Wapak down the road on the schedule. That's how close they could be to getting on a big run, right? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the way just the, the schedule works right now, at the end of this week, there's only going to be three teams left in the Western Buckeye League undefeated in conference play. Good That's point. Could, could St. Mary's, Wapak, and um, – Either the winner of that Shawnee Bath game more likely would, you know, I think if you look at it on paper, that would, could be how it could play out. Western Buckeye League is a tough league. There's a lot of really good teams. We know what Walpock and St. Mary's is, but 
we saw Salina do this last year mm-hmm. where they came kind of came out of nowhere, shocked a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that Shawnee's going to come out and win, win the conference, but this is not the same Shawnee team from last year by any stretch. Now, how good is J.J. Spiker? He's so good. He's so dynamic. And you know what? It's a product of Coach Wireman's system. Mm-hmm. Where we saw him do the same thing over in Waynesville with his QB. They have that freedom to improvise, to extend plays. It's built in ways to allow him to have – it's. It's a different way of looking at that RPO, right? It's not that traditional stick it in the gut, pull it back, right. and run. He, but the pass plays, he has the option. If he sees that he can go, then he goes. And he's very dynamic. I mean, he had 15 carries for 115 yards and a touchdown last week. He also threw for two touchdowns. He's second. <laughs> this is funny to me, considering that St. Mary's is in this league. I don't know if you guys had a chance to look at the Western <laughs> Buckeye League uh, leaders. The two leading rushers in the Western Buckeye League this right. week are quarterbacks. Yeah, yeah. It's the it, Walt Van <laughs> Wert's quarterback yeah. and Shawnee's quarterback. Right. Though mm-hmm. they're the leading rushers in the conference, and you know it, it's well earned. That they're not easy yards that he's gaining either by any stretch. I bet those quarterbacks are happy they're not at St. Mary's, but they've thrown with three <laughs> times <laughs> all year right, long. Right, right. Part of that is too. St. Mary's divides their carries up between three different guys. That's true. And, and those correct. guys get the majority of carries. But you are correct. See, two quarterbacks leading the Western Buckeye League in rushing is an anomaly. Yeah, could you imagine you having three backs like that? And you're like, oh, he got seven yards. Okay, let's see if he can get eight yards. Let's see if this guy can get yeah. nine yards. Yeah, right? I mean the third guy in that. And I mean we're whatever. It's a podcast. We can be off the rails. The it. third guy in that trio over at St. Mary's, he he just had 86 yards <laughs> on like just. eight carries, yeah. though. Like I mean, right, it, right. they just have they right. have domination everywhere. Well, you guys had a great um, best things that you saw all week. Nate and I got to experience one. Uh, the, my best uh, thing I saw this week on Saturday. Um, Wow, what an event it was, it was at, yeah. at uh, Spikes Sets at Sunset at Shawnee High School. Um, hats off to Brooke Hutchins and Steve Owen to AD over there putting on the, that event. Um, they took on Spencerville and won 3-0. But, you know, it wasn't anyone a, a loser that night, were they, Nate? I mean, everybody won. Uh, I mean, it, it, was such a, it was such a unique atmosphere. Nothing about it felt like a regular season varsity volleyball game and right. I don't say that in a bad way yeah, that's it a was good thing. so much fun there's so many things going on every time out they're breaking out in dance breaks and the teams are <laughs> dancing and even when Spencerville was struggling a little bit because they, they've had a little bit of a rough start to this year um you know they still seem to be having fun I mean there were some things that you know I hope this becomes an annual I thing. do Miles, too we talked about yeah, this it was so cool. it was so now there's some things they're going to figure out I think towards the end like we talked like about humidity. yeah we, it, it, luckily that didn't go into a fourth mm. or fifth set we weren't real sure how they were going to be able to finish if yeah. that happened because the floor with the humidity was getting wet girls were slipping it was starting to kind of become is this going to continue to be safe to play um they didn't get that far but that's i nobody thought about that i guarantee it it was please don't rain please don't rain not is the humidity going to drop Correct. a bunch of water on the fl- on the floor so they had an unbelievable setup right the court was close uh, to the sideline on the home side um it was an unbelievable event, but they had a DJ there, DJ Frenzy, which was mm-hmm. fantastic, right? So it was a party atmosphere. The, the whole event was great, but the best thing was, do you remember this, Nate? Because you were dancing to it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what it was. Everybody there, Party in the USA, right before they did the national anthem, every female there was dancing to Party in the USA, yeah, yeah. and it was a celebration of volleyball, man. Yeah, it, 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 it was so yeah. cool, the seated togetherness of, of those teams. And uh, what a great event! I hope that, like you said, I hope they do it again next year and keep do yeah. keep it as a tradition. Yeah, and I, you know, I, again, it's always fun to be a part of history, and it was history. I it mean, was, you know, the first regular season outdoor OHSAA varsity event uh, for volleyball. They did it right for the first one. If it doesn't ever happen again, it was a heck of a way to, right. to start and end it. Now, this team might be better. I'm going to say it. They might be better than than last year's team at the end of the year. And I'm, I'm saying that because they're getting Sydney Burris back. She wasn't been with them. She was fantastic, a different maker as a setter on Saturday. And the young hitters that the Shawnee team has, Gianna Upshaw, fantastic. Uh, Carly and Josie Hutchins. This is a really well-rounded volleyball team. Well, and, you know, watching that team, they're, they're a very different team than last year in the sense right. that you had a lot of seniors and, and there was a lot of size on that team. Freiburger and, was amazing. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah. they had a lot of that. This is a young team. And they're still 
figuring some stuff out, right? Because that's what young players mm -hmm. do, freshmen and sophomores that are heavy into that rotation. And, you know, Coach Hutchins has developed a system there where it's not, ooh, what do we have or how are we going to replace? It's this is the standard. We talked about that on the yeah, broadcast. Right, right. She's developed a standard for them now, and that's what great teams do. And, I mean, she's just following that uh, blueprint right now. And yeah. I'm sure the junior high volleyball team was there for Shawnee. And then Everybody was there. The, yeah. pa yeah, the stands were packed. Girls. I saw other right. teams, volleyball teams there, not to scout. They just wanted to see what it was going to be about. Okay. A lot of fans that you wouldn't typically see were there. It, people just wanted to see what this was. They they just – it brought people in. And, you know, when you can bring eyes to, to you know, volleyball in this area, it's never a bad thing. I, I love the idea of having Saturday Night Volleyball. Yeah. Right, it, it was it was an event. As long as you're not playing at, at the same time as Ohio State, I'm all for it. Right, <laughs> but, the, the long gap between JV game and varsity game, okay. But that wasn't a problem because no. everybody's having so much fun. No. It was not no. a problem. Yep. If that's a, in, a, in your normal gym situation when you got a lengthy gap like that, people are grumbling and whatever. Mm -hmm. Not that night. Yep. And it was just because they wanted the sun they to go down. They wanted to be sun They said, nope, we're yeah. waiting for the sun to go down. So they took the break. They let the sun go down, and, and there they went. All right, nice job, fellas. Up next, we'll have an interview with uh, Shawnee head football coach, Shane Weirman. He'll sit down with us, talk about the Indians 2-0 and start. Today's episode is brought to you by Ultimate Outdoor. Bring resort-style living to your backyard every day with luxury outdoor space by Ultimate Outdoor. Automated pergolas, retractable walls, screens, outdoor furniture, and outdoor kitchens. Layfeld Industrial Supplies and Welding Supplies has everything you need to do the job. From tools and accessories to gases, we're truly a one-stop solution center for every contractor and welder for getting the job done. Not only do we carry the supplies you need, we can deliver them too fast and accurate. See us today at our locations in Greenville and Coldwater. Also, Tom All. Car shopping is different at Tom All. We want to take care of you after the sale because at Tom All, the friendship of our customers and our employees is our number one goal. That's why we have the greatest staff in the business and dedicated to giving you a knock-your-socks-off experience. And finally, Kewpie. Escape the summer heat with a frozen treat from Kewpie. Enjoy a frosted malt, soft-serve frozen yogurt, frozen cappuccino, or a refreshing lemonade slush. Whatever your taste buds desire. Cupy has the treat for a hot summer day. Get yours today at Cupy East, West, or Downtown. Join us now, Shane Weirman, head football coach of Shawnee High School. 2 and O coach. Uh, unbelievable start. Talk to us a little bit about that unbelievable win against Elida on Friday night. Well, you know, finally getting that first WBL win. You know, we got LCC week one, and, and I know that's a rival for the guys, but winning that first uh, league game, kind of getting that under our belt felt pretty good. Kids, a lot of excitement. Um, really just trying to keep guys level-headed now. You know, you go from an 0-10 last year to 2-0, and and you got to make sure you keep everybody grounded, keep everybody humble. So a lot of excitement over our way. But, again, we have a ton of work, a ton of things we got to fix. Uh, but I'd always rather fix those things after a win than after a loss. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Now talk to me about how do you stay humble after 2-0? and What are some things that you use as a coach? Where are your tools? Well, I think the biggest thing is don't forget what last year felt like. And as soon as you let your guard down, you know, I think coming into the season, a lot of people didn't estimate that we would do a whole lot of damage in our conference. And, and we've only got one win in the conference so far. We got eight more and we got to try to go through. Uh, but that's a big thing is just take it one at a time. I know that's kind of coach talk, but making sure that guys realize that once you do got two wins, um, you kind of start getting on teams' radars, and they may take you a little more serious than they did maybe back in the summer. So guys are starting to look at, hey, what are you guys doing over there? And they're starting a game plan for you and kind of getting a, a feel for what we do offensively and defensively. And the more film that's out there, the more opportunity there are for coaches to put game plans together. So we got to keep uh, keep ahead of that as best we can. Well, that was an Elida team that had a lot of firepower on offense. How were you guys able, able to limit them to only 14? You know, their quarterback play, that kid's very accurate. Um, even when we moved him off the spot, I felt like he did a great job of, uh, of finding receivers downfield. He wasn't really looking to make plays with his legs. I thought he did a good job of keeping his eyes up. Um, and some of their skill guys, man, they had some guys open on us on the back end. And uh, one time we had, a, we had a blitz called and they wheeled their guy and it was a great call by them at the perfect time. Um, and they just didn't see him. So, you know, sometimes you got to tip your hat and say, thank goodness the quarterback <laughs> didn't see that guy. Um, and other times you got to say, hey, we had a pretty good thing schemed up there too. So it was a good back and forth game. Uh, but I think the biggest thing I take away from that is, you know, getting down, we have a bad kickoff and a penalty to start the second half and give Elida a 14-7 lead. You know, really gauging our team. Are we going to put our heads down? Are we going to say, here we go again? Um, to see our guys battle back and get that game back to even and then put a score together late. I thought that was a big uh, step in the right direction for our program. Coach, you're very successful at Waynesfield. 
Some coaches are system guys. We're running my system. Other coaches come in and say, okay, what's in the room here and what do I have to work with? What have you done at Shawnee? System, analyze talent, what have you done? I think every coach has sets that they really like and, and things that they, you know, I think if it's something you believe in, you got to coach those things. And I never will tell guys to go coach something you don't believe in because kids will see through that. But to your point, you have to find – uh, the very best way to use the kids that you have. And sometimes uh, that's one thing that's been different at Shawnee than was at Waynesfield is we have some sub packages where we can say, hey, you three guys are coming in the game and you three are coming out and trying to utilize every kid to their strength. Now, as a coach, you also got to make sure you don't put too many tendencies on there. When this guy comes in the game, they Absolutely, always do this. Yeah. So you kind of know what's on film and then you start trying to build off of that. But that's really where we're at is just trying to get the very most that we can on each kid. Um, and, I, and we tell guys that whether you're in for three plays those three plays we put you in there, we're expecting you to do this. Um, and you might be a guy that gets 50 plays. Well, we're expecting this out of you. So when your number's called, if it's a bunch of plays or a few plays, we want the same effort and the same execution that you can give every single time that you're out there. You know, so, Coach, first, uh, I'd like to say thank you because it's been a lot more pleasant in the Garlock household this year <laughs> than in previous years. So it, it, we've had a lot, a lot smoother nights, that, and I really appreciate that. Um, you know, one of the things that you talked about was the mentality uh, of this team, and I've been talking about it for a couple of weeks. I've had your, your first two games um, for WOSN, and the mentality of this team is, is, is different. Um, I, I don't think they win week one or week two if you hadn't changed the mentality of this team. What all went into that? I mean, how that is not an easy thing to do to shift a mentality from, you know, when things start going round, going bad, it's, oh, here we go again. And, you know, well, this is just people expect us to lose, so we're going to lose and hang in our heads. H how hard has that been to get that shift? It's a process, and that shift that you're speaking of isn't even all done yet. You know, that's going to take – sometimes it takes multiple seasons with mm -hmm. those kids. You know, you get a senior group that you have in there, and that was one of the first things I thought was important. Um, I told the seniors, I said, hey, you guys have had new coaches almost every year. You know, you're looking at another new guy walking in the door, and why should you believe anything I'm telling you that, that these other three guys maybe haven't said to you in the past? So we've just had some real just be transparent, be real with each other. You know, I want to see those kids be successful, but we've talked a lot about the seniors laying a foundation. You know, we're not a finished product probably by the time week 10 gets here, and if we make postseason, we won't be a finished product then. But this year, I'm hoping that those guys can look back and say, hey, our senior class laid that foundation for years to come at Shawnee football. And, and it's not easy. Um, you know, when you get a lot of bad habits grained in you and you get that mentality that's maybe tilted the wrong way, those things will flare up from time to time. And you can't be afraid as a coach to just confront it with a respectful way, like that's that's the old way we did things, and we're not doing things like that now. And and kids, you got to give them a little space to event because they have that's the way things have been. So um, you got to kind of take it with a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But that's the big thing: be honest with your kids, um, put put on them uh, the expectation. What I've found is kids will meet the expectation if you set it out there. Absolutely, they may not meet it exactly day one, but if you keep saying no, that's not the market we're trying to hit. Those kids will eventually get there, um, and we want those seniors um, to train these young guys up and there's a bright future over there. there's a lot of talent there's a lot it's not a lack of talent that has been the flaw of Shawnee football from what I can see there's lots of talent there but I think that's a big difference in maybe how that talent's being utilized as opposed to maybe other guys use it in the past you got to have leadership when you turn things around right how do you identify who those alphas are in your program and let them become the leaders it didn't take very long for me to figure out who some of those guys were just from the very first time that they let me introduce myself to the team um, you can get a vibe for those old guys that's making the eye contact, who you got their full attention. Absolutely. They don't know you from anybody, and they're locked into what you got to say. Um, they're nodding their head. They're tracking you when you're speaking. Um, and then you got to teach those details to these young kids. Like when a coach is talking to you, your eyes shouldn't be at the ground. You shouldn't be, you know, just waiting for somebody to get done talking. Like listen to what's being said because obviously – there's a message in there, even if it's just a little detail for that person. So um, I, I seen that right away. And the seniors, you know, again, I, I got a lot of respect for a group of nine to come in and, and they've taken me in as one of their own. I mean, I've tried to repay that same thing to them. I know we don't get as much time together as you like, but I feel like there's a good bond there. And I'm hoping that those guys will take something away from this season beyond the wins and losses that, hey, this guy planted some seeds in there that's going to go with me well after I'm done playing football. Coach, when I look at your statistics on the year, your number of yards offensively passing and rushing are almost identical. 
a, a game plan that you have, and how do you track that to make sure you stay on with that through the course of a game? Well, we got guys in the box. That's like everybody tracking those, and you're trying to balance it out. But you guys know the game of football. Sometimes the defense is just like, we're not going to let you have that play. So the ball has to go to somebody else. And that's a, another tough thing to explain to kids is, hey, your number, sometimes you're not getting the ball, but you're drawing double coverage. You're not getting the runs, but you're getting all the reaction out of the linebackers and the D linemen to set up these other guys. So um, we want to stay balanced, but also we really look at each opponent differently. If we got a team that's going to stack the box and try to shut a run down, we may throw it a little bit more than we would, you know, in weeks prior to. But that's just something you try to adapt. Um, the biggest one I think that we got to speak of more is our quarterback play with JJ, uh, JJ Spiker. He's been very, I mean, his stats are almost identical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes 190 passing and like 150, 190 rushing in games. Um, there's guys that are, again, there, there's going to be more and more teams start trying to take that away and force us to beat beat them with something else and we're aware of that so um, we're preparing for those things when those things come about we got to be ready to kind of go to those change up plays that we've got built in when we need to use them but um, it's a challenge um, and Elida was I mean they have a, one of the best pass rushers in the conference there with number 50 I mean Parker we Grimm. were talking yeah. about double teaming him chipping him with the back setting a tight end over there and sometimes you can do all that stuff and the guy <laughs> still wreck a play so I mean <laughs> you just got to do what you can you tip your hat you give respect to a kid but you can't change your whole playbook because of one kid on the field so mo moving forward you know you just got your first taste of the western buckeye league you know the, a gauntlet still uh, awaits you how do you continue to grow a team and, and get a team better also knowing that there are going to be a lot of bumps that you have to come across in that western buckeye league uh, just keeping your your focus as, as narrow as you can. You know, we're looking at bat this week, but you're spot on. There's a lot of great coaching staffs, a lot of great football teams um, in the middle of our schedule. I, I, I won't even say middle. I mean, everybody we face and you watch the film, you're like, this team could beat us. Um, and, and you're going to see a lot of close games. That was one of the things I noticed coming in. Um, even your maybe yeah, even like Shawnee last year, you look at 0 and 10, but how many games were within a score? Right, uh, right. Oh, if you don't have a bad snap on a special teams play, you get this game or that game. Um, these games are tight, and I think we learned something last week. I don't think our game management was the gr the greatest there. Um, little brother calling the offense, I was like, you know, in this, it's we might just need to put the ball on the ground three times and get the <laughs> clock ran out, you know, um, because the game plays out much differently than where I've been other places. So uh, we're going to learn. There's going to be some learning curves for us, but um, what I don't want our guys, and I'm just being honest, I don't want to fear anybody on our schedule. And I know the St. Mary's is of the world and the Walpawks, those teams that have been running the conference here lately, you know, Van Wert's been really good. Defiance, Salina had a heck of a year last year. I mean, you can go on and on. Um, there's not a team on there that if you – I mean, there's nobody you're going to look past and then think you're going to go through the motions and win. So I think our guys know that, and we just have to make sure we keep them focused on the task at hand. Um, and, and I think it's going to be – we see when that bump in the road happens, um, we'll see how we bounce back and grow from it and, and learn. Um, every experience is, is a learning experience. Whether you win or lose, there's always something you can, can learn from that, and that's kind of how we'll approach it. Well, let's talk about your quarterback, J.J. Spiker, quickly becoming uh, one of the best players in the area, uh, getting mentioned in that. What makes him the dude for you guys? Uh, my biggest thing that I keep saying about him, he's a competitor. Um, I don't care in practice, man. Sometimes I got to tone him back a little bit. I was like, I know the offensive lineman missed a block on that or the snap <laughs> wasn't where you wanted it. But there's a right way to correct our teammates, and there's a wrong way to do it. So i got to sometimes dial him back down. Uh, but I'd rather have to dial a kid back than to try to get something more out of him than they have. So I think that's a good place to coach from. Um, he's very competitive. Um, he's learning a ton. I really think that he's – you haven't seen the best of him. Uh, his running ability is what it is. But he is still learning – how to read those coverages and to pick up on who you know who I'm keying on this concept that we're running and I think the more comfortable he gets with that I think you're going to see a very dynamic quarterback out of him as he finishes through this junior year and into his senior year. I think I think he's really going to be a handful for teams to try to stop. What's his best route that he throws? Well, I'll tell you, it's not the flag pattern right now. He has a hard time with that one. I put some information out there. But he obviously, every, every quarterback in here loves to throw the ball deep. And I think yeah. he does a good job. Um, he's learned to put more touch on some of those deep passes, whether it's the, the post, the Garlock, or some of the, you know, using uh, Davison on the outside there. We just have a lot of guys that can really uh, do some good things with the football if we can just get them down there and throw the ball around a little bit. So 
I don't think any quarterback ever, I'll be honest, I don't, they're like, they're like baseball hitters. Every pitch looks good. Every I throw them all, coach. So <laughs> that's kind of how he is. Well, coach, obviously you're the head coach of the Shawnee program, but you're also the CEO of Shawnee football. So what are you doing with your JV kids, your middle school kids, even lower than that to build interest so you can sustain what you got going this year? This first year, and that's been something that I've really focused on, is really trying to get the junior high and the high school and marry the two programs together. Um, I, I wish I could get down to that youth level a little more than I have been, but that's definitely on my radar to do. But I feel like until I get the middle school, high school really unified, I really don't want to get too broad in my scope there. But that's a huge thing, and that's something that I think these programs that are ahead of the game in our conference, if you go watch junior high games, that you can say, hey, that's the offense they run on Friday night. Mm -hmm. That's the defense they run on Friday night. And getting kids in that system, I think that will be huge for us as we go through the process. Uh, getting kids that come in and know those basic things that we're going to run at the high school level will be a big, big plus for us. Uh, but I think also being present at those things. Um, I know every time we have a home, seventh grade, eighth grade, JV game, um, one thing I've been big on my staff is we got to go coach our kids. Um, I know there's some people's like, well, I'm a varsity coach only. Like, we, we're not rolling that way. Like, if I'm a coach on this staff, if I'm available after we're done doing our films and that on Saturday morning, uh, if we got to travel or if we got to walk out back to go to the game, we want to get out there and coach those kids the same way we coach on Friday night, same way in practice. Um, too many times bigger programs have kids standing around. Um, we do a lot of split field stuff where we got our young guys running, a, you know, huddled down here against the JVs, and we got our old guys down here running that group against our seconds. So that's what I think is big. Everybody's active. I mean, you have a few guys, no matter how you do it, that, that will be rotating. But, you know, if you can keep 44 guys active as opposed to 22, that's huge. And that's what we've been pushing for in practice keep guys competing and working and doing things constantly versus just standing and watch somebody else work. You know, we all like to have an exclusive, okay? So, and I'm sorry, Coach, I'm going to uh – -oh. I'm, I'm going to – I'm going to give the secret away. I, I know why this Indians team has been turned around and they're so good all of a sudden. Let's tell us. It's championship breakfast on Saturday morning. Oh. I can tell you, my son, he runs the film a lot faster every morning on Saturday <laughs> mornings now, knowing that there's a big old breakfast waiting for him after wins. So do you regret that with the bigger grocery bill now? You know, we're moving from the, to, to the D3 school. A lot more kids running around you guys got to feed. <laughs> we, that is something we've loved doing. And, and I, I'll tell a little story about that. When we first started, we had a rough start when we got there at Waynesfield. And we said, hey, when we got our first win over there, we like, we're going to do breakfast. And that first time, we only fed two breakfasts. And then it turned into five and seven and nine and then ten. And it was like, you know, it's something that became part of what we do. Um, and I'll, anywhere I ever go and coach, as long as I do it, as long as I'm able, I just think it's an awesome thing. Um, those guys work so hard to get those wins on Friday night. And that's a fun place where you can kind of let your guard down for a half hour and say, hey, man, let's pig out on some breakfast. <laughs> let's all eat some pancakes, biscuits, and gravy, whatever we got. We just we set it out there and let them eat until it's gone. And that's kind of how I like to do it. So um, I think it's for all the work that they give us, that's a little way that I think uh, me and my wife, my wife is the one that comes in and cooks it. Um, any coach that does this very long, you got to have a spouse that's all in. Oh, and I'll say that I for doubt. sure. Um, she's been a, she runs our film. She helps do our press box film. And she helps do breakfast. She's washed uniforms. She's just a great, uh, great help. And I don't think I could do anything I'm doing without having her be that on board what we're doing. So well, it's awesome having a spouse that's that's a football uh, person too. Why do I think the linemen like championship breakfast a little bit better than the rest of the <laughs> I'll guys? I tell you what, yeah. the, way, the, the way the oldest comes in afterwards, those receivers are getting plenty of food <laughs> too. I promise you, and coach. You can't be successful without a quality assistant coaches. Break down your staff for us and tell us uh, all the good things about these guys. Well, we was able to bring three guys with me from my Waynesfield staff. Um, I would have brought everybody if I could, but um, I felt like they're the one guy we had left over there, had a son on the team. I wanted to leave him back, and I think that was the right thing to do. But uh, I'll speak to this point first. I have two brothers I coach with. Um, I have an older brother and a younger brother, and for some reason it just didn't work out. We never got to play in high school together. My older brother missed me by a few years, mm -hmm. and my younger brother missed me by a few years. So we never got to play on the field together. So it was one of those things like, well, maybe it'd be pretty cool if we all coached together. And it started out that way, and, and that's what's made it. Coaching, any of you guys that do it, you guys know it's only as enjoyable as the guys that you got around you. And we have a lot of great staff. Um, we had some carryover guys that were, that were fit in great with us. We complement each other for the things that we maybe aren't as strong at, they do a good job with. Uh, but we have a growing staff, too. We have, I mean, there's some experienced guys. We have a lot of young guys that are really – 
I'm impressed with where they started at um, just in the summer to where they're at now, how much more vocal and more, uh, I guess they feel like they have that voice to be in there and kind of command some things during practice. And I really think that's going to be huge for our program because getting those guys um, as a head coach, you're only one voice, man, and there's too many guys for right. one guy mm -hmm. to coach. So uh, having those assistants around you is, is a huge, huge uh, uh, plus to have. And, again, getting to do with my brothers. I, I can't speak enough about that. It's pretty awesome getting to coach with both of my brothers. All right, let's, let's get into the bath game a little bit here. Uh, unbelievable job of throwing the football bath. They are on a roll. You guys are on a roll. Irresistible force, immovable object. Uh, what's going to happen on Friday night? Well, I think it's going to come down to the same thing, the big plays. Uh, you watched the Van Wert game that Bath played. Uh, I think 43 points they hung on those guys, um, and it was big play after big play after big play. They, um, I've never seen a roster. I know some guys might inflate their numbers, but I've never <laughs> seen that many six one, six two, six three right, guys right. that they have on that roster that play skill positions. And uh, their quarterback's a junior, and it looks like he's got a good trigger. He's, he's accurate. He's not afraid to use his legs. Um, they are a, a tough matchup on offense because they present so many different formations and motions and trades. They move guys around. They really want to play with your eyes um, when they're on offense. And that's usually, if you think about big plays, it comes from a defensive back getting his eyes in the wrong spot just for you know that long and somebody's behind you. And that's been a challenge all week is making sure that we're communicating, we're picking up on those things, and guys have, have done a good job with it. But, again, we're going to utilize some time tomorrow. I mean, Thursday, we're going to make sure we're still uh, communicating all those things and make sure guys are on the same page. And uh, their offensive line, I've, they have five guys up there that are all – I mean, they are big guys up front. They do a good job pass blocking. Um, they're, they're a solid, solid football team on offense. And defensively, uh, they make it tough on you. They're not going to let you run the ball a whole lot, and they don't give up the big play. They want to force you to kind of throw underneath and, and put those longer drives together. So I think it's going to be a tough matchup uh, on Friday night. You, know, you talked about, um, you know, your DBs and, you know, the wrong reads. You guys have, with the speed that you have on the team in those positions by yourself, you guys have been able to get away with some mistakes here early where those guys with their, their speed have been able to make up for that. How is that progress coming? You know, obviously as a coach, you know, you love speed, but you don't want them to have to use it to make up for, for those mistakes. Um, how, how is that coming, getting ready for Bath and knowing what you guys are going to have coming? Absolutely. You love having the speed to kind of correct yourself when there's a mistake out there. But at some point, even speed's not going to make up for a blown assignment. So uh, I think the guys have done a good job of staying locked in on the back end. Um, that is a – I think our strength back there is we've got two senior safeties that are our communicators. And when they're communicating, I tell you what, our defense plays really good. Mm -hmm. And we've talked a lot about when you have a – if you're a quiet defense, you're, you're going to be a defense that gets beat up on mm -hmm. uh, because you're only as strong as the communication. Every guy out there has to know what we're trying to do on that – particular play uh, but we still I mean it's one of those things it's a work in progress um, we hope that we don't see guys running free back there but it's one of those things that you coach and coach and coach um, but we tell those guys too you got to have a short memory you know every once in a while they just they get a play on you um, uh, we're a blitz defense sometimes and I tell them I'll own it I'll say hey, sometimes I blitz and the guy that should have been the guy covering that is the guy going for the quarterback so and I tell them I said hey that's on me and I'll own that and I say but we're not going to change who we are uh, we want to get pressure on that quarterback sometimes, and and that's why they call it a blitz. It's a gamble. So sometimes you gotta you gotta go for the money, and and you can't give that guy all day to throw, or they will eventually going to get somebody open back there. So it's a process from the front to the back for sure. Coach is a guy who lives in Bath Township, spent a lot of years teaching in the Bath school system. Can you give me your first ten plays you're going to run on Friday night? <laughs> Good luck, Coach. We, we try to stay as neutral as we can, and I really appreciate from a. Just from a, from a fan standpoint, what you've been able to do with Shawnee so far? Well, I appreciate you guys having yeah, me on. It, sometimes it's harder than other times to stay neutral around here, Mark, just to be honest. Really <laughs> Coach, uh, after meeting Nate, are you surprised at how good of an athlete Michael is? <laughs> I don't know. We have to get him up and have him run a few routes here and see where, <laughs> see hey, where listen, he got this Those from. hands are genetic. Those hands are genetic. <laughs> <laughs> well, Coach Weirman, thanks so much for coming in and spending some time with us. Doing a great job, 2-0. You keep it up, man. We're all rooting for you. I appreciate you guys coach. having me on. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Coach. Today's episode is brought to you by Ultimate Outdoor. Bring resort-style living to your backyard every day with luxury outdoor space by Ultimate Outdoor. Automated pergolas, retractable walls, screens, outdoor furniture, and outdoor kitchens. 
Layfeld Industrial Supplies and Welding Supplies has everything you need to do the job, from tools and accessories to gases. We're truly a one-stop solution center for every contractor and welder for getting the job done. Not only do we carry the supplies you need, we can deliver them too fast and accurate. See us today at our locations in Greenville and Coldwater. Also, Tom All. Car shopping is different at Tom All. We want to take care of you after the sale. Because at Tom All, the friendship of our customers and our employees is our number one goal. That's why we have the greatest staff in the business and dedicated to giving you a knock-your-socks-off experience. And finally, Kewpie. Escape the summer heat with a frozen treat from Kewpie. Enjoy a frosted malt, soft-serve frozen yogurt, frozen cappuccino, or a refreshing lemonade slush. Whatever your taste buds desire, Kewpie has the treat for a hot summer day. Get yours today at Kewpie East west or downtown oh it's time for the wsn week three schedule and boy do we have some unbelievable games this week let's start with patrick henry going to columbus grove both teams sitting at two and oh mark how do you see this one well patrick henry has outscored their two opponents hicksville and airsville 95 to 8 on the season their are offensive running backs have some incredible numbers. Rudders averaging 17 yards a carry. Smith's averaging 14 yards a carry. We all know about Lincoln Krieger. He's averaging 22 yards a carry. Plus, he's completed 11 out of his 16 passes. They don't throw the football a lot. They would prefer to run the football. But that's something Grove typically defends very, very well. So we'll see how that plays out. And, of course, Grove's got some outstanding numbers, too. Uh, I mean, Brazza's averaging 8.9 a carry. Eversol's at 6. Uh, Landon Best having a great year throwing the football around, so it has the makings of being a very balanced football game with two really talented offensive teams that don't give up a lot of points. Yeah, both teams are off to a great start. Mark, a little bit surprised how well Columbus Grove handled Liberty Benton last week, 42-14. to yeah, absolutely. That was a great win for Columbus Grove. And, you know, this game last year, Patrick Henry won 40 to 28. The other thing, Miles, uh, Scott Truxel, he's his sports editor for the Van Wert Independent. A couple of years ago, he really had Columbus Grove down like fourth or fifth in his predictions for the Northwest Conference that year. And they won the conference, and they did a football where they, all the players signed it, and the coaches brought it over and gave it to Scott Truxel. Oh he was on the air on 99.7 WKSD. I'm not voting against Grove in any way, shape, or form because I don't want to give them that motivation <laughs> and be in Scott Truxel's position. So I really like Columbus Grove. I like what they're doing. They're one of my top five power teams, and uh, they're just having an outstanding beginning of the season. Well, they've played eight times, and Groves won five. So it's just that balanced, and I would look forward to be that balanced again on, on Friday night. Uh, Bill Inselman does a great job at Patrick Henry. Seems like he's been there 100 mm -hmm. years, and you go to his practice, he still has amazing energy coaching all the time. He's a lot of fun. Now, Nate, one thing that Patrick Henry loves to do under direction of Ben George defensively, they love to attack they love the blitz. Is that a good recipe for them against Columbus Grove? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, truthfully, you know, with Landon Best and then just the playmaking ability of Braz in the backfield, you know, trying to send those extra bodies in, they're so good at being elusive. One miss and they're gone. I don't think you can risk sending in all that pressure. Just those guys are too good. You're going to need as much help as you can. You're going to have to try to keep them in front of you as much as you can. Now, they could go in there and, you know, Columbus Grove could think the way that I think and be like, you know, they're, they're not going to and they catch them off guard. But I, I just don't know that you want to risk it in that game with, with just how good, especially Barraza seems to be heating up. Best has looked really mm -hmm. well. They have other playmakers stepping up for Grove this year as well. Columbus Grove is a problem. Yeah, and, yeah. and yeah. you know, and Patrick Henry has their hands full. Well, the other thing is, although home field may be not as important in football as some of the other sports, their record at Climber Stadium is outstanding. Crazy. You, you get Columbus Grove at home, and that, that's a problem right there for PH. Yeah, I, if I'm Columbus Grove, I look at Patrick Henry and I say, we're not Hicksville and we're not Ayersville. Yeah. Watch out, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Uh, one other thing that is uh, worth a note, Grant Smith, uh, you mentioned him as a running back last year at Patrick Henry, 23 sacks. 23 sacks. Mm. That, that's absolutely an insane number. So it is a, a game Patrick Henry team. Keep an eye on Lincoln Krieger. He is a fantastic guy. I know Minnesota is in love with him. So he's a guy that's going to play at the next level. And you can see it on WTLW, 9 o'clock on Saturday morning with Miles. <laughs> and right. how many, Randy, how many games have you done together now? This will be our 201st game there together. Go. Yeah, Randy Roberts. He's been carrying me for a long time. <laughs> All right, game number two, Ottawa Glendorf at Wapakoneta. Patrick Kamler and uh, Darren Gilbert on the call. Nate, how do you see this one? So, I mean, at, at the end of the day, 
you know, Walpock has been playing fantastic. Them and St. Mary's right now are at the top of the WBL, and I think a lot of people realize that that's where the conference is going to run through. To me, this is this is a gut check game for Ottawa Glendorf. Not in the sense of we have to win this one, but it's going to be a great measuring stick for where we are as a program. Mm. You know, the coming off of the first of the win against Kenton last week, uh, it's a big win for a program that just went one and nine last year. And you talked about you heard a. Um, Coach Wireman talking about a special teams mishap. Well, that's what costs Shawnee against OG. It was an onside kick that they couldn't handle, led to OG winning that one. And that's so OG had to win a close one against the Indians last year. So you get that monkey off your back early in the season. Coach Reiner still just one win away from 200. Mm -hmm. A lot going on within that program. Okay, are we going to be a competitive team now compared to maybe where we were last year. That's that measuring stick this week against Walpock. I think when you look at it on paper, this is Walpock's game to lose, right? Moyer has had a fantastic start mm-hmm. to the season. They've done a great job with Caden Page filling that role that Grant Jolly left. They have athletes everywhere. The O-line had a lot of guys leave. They've answered those questions. They've been up to the up to the task so far this season. You know, but I think Ottawa Glandorf can learn a lot about who they are and who they're going to be moving forward this week. Dave, Ottawa Glandorf forced uh, three fumbles against Kenton last week. Big reason why they won. They have to do the same to get to win at Wapakoneta? They do. They've got to win the turnover battle, and they've got to have some other breaks go their way as well. And Talking about measuring stick, this was a game that Wapak won last year, 45-0. to zero. So I agree with you, Nate. It gets back to OG doesn't necessarily need to win this game, but it needs to be a competitive game for them, and it's something they can build off of going into week four. Well, let's look at the positives for OG. Now, obviously, they're the underdog in here, but they've only been penalized four times on the year. Yeah. They're not going to make a mistake in that particular that's area. That's a Ken Schreiner team right there. And that's right. Yeah. Last week, Evers ran for 199 yards and three scores. Yep. If, and it's a big if because Wapak is good defensively, if OG has a chance, they have to run the football, shorten the game down, and make it a game they don't turn the ball over and don't have penalties and don't shoot themselves in the foot and still have to deal with Moyer when he gets the football. Well, and I think that's a great point because – I. The fact that it doesn't all have to be done by Kuhlman now, right? Mm-hmm. It, it was just showing himself more than capable of handling the load for that offense. Now we, we don't have to worry about throwing it a bunch of times. A lot of that pressure has been taken off of him. If they can find some running lanes, you know, Evers is a very good running back. I yes. mean, hundred, you know, Kenton struggled defending the run this year, but putting up 199 yards and three touchdowns is not an easy task. And if that can be sort of the identity moving forward for the Titans, they become a very different dynamic of a team. Well, Puck is second in the conference in scoring. Behind Van Wert, now they're going to put 34 plus on the game on the board against a lot of teams. OG has to find a way to keep the ball out of Moyer's hands. OG's pretty good against the run. They at least they have been statistically so far. But even though that that's not what Wapak is based on, they will run the football. But Moyer is their their leader. And he's done very well for them so far. And still has a throw an interception, just like ever. He never throws interceptions. So three drives of six minutes or more, that was the formula for OG mm-hmm. and turnovers against Kenton. And you mentioned Evers run into football, right? Well, let me tell you why he was able to run the football. Scrap Iron Vinny Brinkman. <laughs> That guy is a contact <laughs> magnet, man. He would come in motion. We would highlight him. He would kick out the end. I don't know if I've ever seen a better night for a lead blocker. He got on a Kenton guy every single time and then just drove him to the ground. He was absolutely fantastic. That's what OG is going to have to absolutely. have against Wapakoneta. Yeah, I mean, they got to find ways to have those long drives, right? They got to milk mm-hmm. the clock. The less time that Walpawk has the ball in their hands, only is going to benefit the Titans, and that's the best way to do it. All right, third game on our schedule. Uh, Bath at Shawnee. Nate Garlic and John Zerbi will be on the call. Nate, how tough is it for you to be impartial when you're calling out <laughs> Shawnee? Game? You know, it's it's usually not too bad. Usually the worst part is for my son, who when he messes up, I make sure I highlight that very very <laughs> clearly on the broadcast and, and say we'll discuss this later. Um, you know, but this is a big game, and you know, obviously, you know, with a Shawnee football player living in the house, you know, I, I he we talk about this quite a bit. The the team has done a nice job of kind of keeping themselves down. Coach Weirman has done a nice job of tempering and saying, hey, listen, we haven't done anything yet. Two wins a season doesn't make. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those guys are focused on Bath. Um, I heard they didn't have uh, the greatest of practice one day this week. Mm -hmm. Coach let them know, get them refocused and got them ready. And the next day, it was a good practice. Um, And so they're going to need to be ready, though. Uh, 
you know, Zach Welsh had a heck of a week last week against Van Wert. Boy, did it. He set a school record with 386 yards. He threw for four touchdowns. Mikey Hale ran in for two touchdowns. The, he, he can also catch the ball and run it in. They have playmakers. And, and Zach Welsh is only seeming to get better in that Bath offense the more time that he spends in it. Shawnee is going to have to. That's why, you know, I wanted to ask Coach about the secondary and that communication because if those guys aren't on it, Zach Welsh can carve them up. And so it's going to be a good game because Shawnee has a lot of playmakers themselves. We talked about J.J. Spiker and how dynamic he can be with the ball in his hands. The, the nice thing is, is he can get it done. He's not one-dimensional. He can get it done in the air. He can get it done on his feet. Defenses have to be ready. They can't bite when he starts to run because he can put it over the top just as easily. Dave, you've coached for a lot of years. How tough is it when you have a week where there's a Labor Day and your practice and your school schedule gets off? Kids need to have that consistency. How tough is that? It's very tough, and we talk about that all the time, you know, coaching basketball when you have sickness and kids out and then you have the snow days. The difference here is they planned for Monday. They knew they were going to be out, and the weather's been – better this week compared right. to last week. So you're trying to get back into that consistent practice uh, flow and be ready to go. But we got the insider information from Nate there a little bit. They had a bad practice and it was addressed. Not surprising. Yep. You know, that's great. But I call this game my rock climbing game of the week, guys. Because <laughs> looking closely from afar, you have Shawnee at 2-0, 0-10 last year. You know, it wasn't very long ago, Bath. Their football program was really struggling. So mm -hmm. it's really neat to see these two programs moving up. And I, I look at leagues, especially in football, you have your bottom third, your middle, and then your top three. And it's so hard to move from one area to the, to, from the other. And, and that's what we're seeing here. And I just think this is going to be an outstanding football game. Last year, Bath wins it 20-17 to 17 in overtime. And I think it's a flip of the coin right now. It's going to be a fun one to watch, a great one to call. Absolutely. Can't wait. Mark, this one has a feel if it's a 30-plus point game, that it's going to be a Bath win, doesn't it? I think Bath has to put a lot of points on the board. Now, we've talked about Welch. He did have a really good week last week. Mikey Hale didn't run the ball much against New Bream, and they lost that game 17-14. to 14. He got some carries last week. He's a really hard runner for a small kid, small in stature, but he runs really hard. He's a really good runner between the tackles. And they've got four really good wide receivers. Jackson Foster's got 12 catches. Mark Lee and Clark have seven catches each. Ethan Cole is as fast as it comes. He's a great track kid. And so they get the football in those people's hands. They can do some things. Welsh doesn't typically throw the ball deep. He's not going to throw the ball 40 yards downfield, but he'll be really accurate in that 10 to 12 to 15 yard range and let those guys make some plays out of that. But Bass defense has not been particularly good on the season. They give up 17 to Bremen. They give up 37 to a talented offensive team at Van Wert. Bath has struggled defensively for the last two years. Well, let's, let's call it 13 games in the Coach Russell time period. They need to tighten some things up because Shawnee is, can be dynamic offensively. Before we move on real quick, I do want to give, you know, you talked about Zach Welsh and, and they got to put a lot of points on the board. The one thing that's going to prevent, prevent that, and I think has been lost with the, this Indians team and all the talk about J.J. Spiker and, you know, their secondary and their senior leadership, Akaius Richardson is, he plays, he's listed at tight end, but he's also defensive end for them. He caused so much havoc last week against Eli getting in that backfield. Sure. Ryan Magoo only had nine completions in that game, and it was because Richardson spent an awful lot of time in that backfield, and a lot of times he drew the assignment of Parker Krim on that O-line, and he did a tremendous job getting by him. He's going to have to have a big game for the Indians on Friday. One would not have think going into the last week's game, Elida would have been held to 14 points and nine completions Absolutely. because that is the strength of their team, and Shawnee took away their strength last week by doing the things you mentioned. To me, it, it, who's ever secondary does a better job tackling, I think is going to win this football game. One guy I want to highlight for Bath, Vinny Vendetta. Is there a better name in football <laughs> than Vinny Vendetta? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like one of your nicknames. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he had four interceptions a year ago, a tremendous tackler. So keep an eye on both secondaries. All right, uh, game number four, St. Henry at Marion Local. Garrett Seawright and uh, Mark Shine are yeah, going to be at that. that one. You guys get to hang out. Uh, Mark, we'll start with you. Uh, St. Henry, <laughs> a much improved team this year, putting some points up, but they haven't seen a front seven like Marion Local yet, have they? No, they've not. Uh, this is obviously a, an improved St. Henry team from a year ago. They got their first win, of course, for their new coach. But that was over Archibald, 42-14. to 14. 
Um, but it's a team that got into the running game. When we saw them in the opener against St. Mary's, they came out their first two or three possessions, and they threw the ball about six times on their first three possessions, and they went three and out. Then they went to the running game, and they have a really good running back. Charlie Whirling now has 345 yards in two football games, and he, he did some of that against that St. Mary's defense. So that's something they have to bank on. It's really hard to run against that front seven that you mentioned from, from Mary Local. I keep trying to find different things to look at for Marion Local to highlight. <laughs> right. Okay, you guys, I bet you know the answer to this without even asking the question. In two football games, how many times has Marion Local punted? I guess zero. Once. Zero. Oh, <laughs> zero. Wow. I mean, no. there just have been so – Knopf has, has missed two passes on the season in two football games as it's, their quarterback. He needs I mean, to practice. He, practice yeah, he, he missed two yeah. of them. Yeah. No interceptions. It's just they do so many things so well that this will be a difficult game for St. Henry, and it's at Marion Local. Dave, one thing I always notice about Marion Local is their linebackers are such fast-flow linebackers. What is it about that front seven for them that impresses you? Well, first of all, you're saying front seven. You're not bringing any individual names out. Right, right, it, It's right. a team piece, and it fits the cliche. I know it's overused sometimes, but – if there's ever a picture you can put on the wall that fulfills this cliche, it is the whole is greater than the individual parts. You've talked about individual players for every game that we have up to this point. You've mentioned one Marion Local guy, Mark. Right. One guy. It is a total team Not concept. The punter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the oldest guy in the field. <laughs> you, you, when you think of Marion Local and – Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that's what this is all about. But you think about Tim Goodwin, and then you think about players as a whole, collective whole. They don't have guys going to Ohio State. They don't have guys you know, here and there. But overall, they are just so consistent. And you're talking about that front seven flowing together. That's what they do. That is what they do as a collective whole, and that is what makes them so impressive, and that's why they're going for win 51, and St. Henry would love to be the team that stops that, as would every other MAC team, but wow. Dave, if St. Henry shows up with Jim Lachey, Bobby Hung, and Todd <laughs> Beckman, do they still have a shot or no? They do not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they do not. Those guys are old. Miles, My, I, I know Coach Goodwin's parents really well. I, I see them every Sunday in church. His mom has a beautiful red dress. She is not allowed to wear it in front of Tim because he hates red because of St. Henry. Henry. <laughs> That's great. So, so you'll love this, Miles, okay? You know, St. Henry trying to be the one in 50 and 1. I just don't see it happening. And it no. ha it, It's nothing against St. Henry no. or any of these no. other programs. It just... Every week, all of us, are, are, we look at the slate of games, we look at these matchups, and it, it's, it, it's nothing against anybody else. It's just until somebody can show a weakness in a Marion local team, there's really no reason to look anywhere else because I, don't, I can't ever remember looking at a team and thinking, well, that's how you beat them. They're, I don't know how you beat Marion local. I, they, they don't seem to have any flaws. And everybody does. I know nothing is perfect, but right, it goes back to remember the Titans, right? And the scene, mm -hmm. and, you know, we all are flawed, but as a team, we're perfect. Right. And that seems to be Marion local. Yeah. And one other thing, real sure. quick. Uh, last Saturday, as I mentioned earlier, I'm down at Marion local for a volleyball uh, match and I pull into the parking lot and they've got a home football game. And I look at the Marion local kids out there and I'm like, man. This is what it is. They put their varsity team in pads again on Saturday morning because they were so big. <laughs> yeah. right. And I talked to Jacob Sherrick. He said, no, that's just our JV guys. <laughs> Had an old uh, coach when I was a young coach tell me the first thing you have to learn is not to lose games, right? And Marion Local, they, they never beat themselves, right? They, they are fantastic at that fundamentally sound. Uh, game number five, Liberty Benton at one and one goes to Macomb. Garrett Mansfield and Dar Nevergal will be on that one. Dave, let's start with you. That's a Macomb team that every year is physical. Chris Algie does a great job there. Really one of the best uh, kept secrets in coaching in Northwest Ohio. Year in, year out, they always do well. You saw them against Crestview last week where they uh, beat up on Crestview 31-14. to 
14, where I'm pretty sure they fall out of your power five at the end of uh, today's well, Crespi segment. was not in my power five. <laughs> all, right, all right, all right. We, we got him in there as honorable mention, but they were not in my power five. But yeah, McComb, I know, I know the Knights really, really wanted that game because uh, McCombs had had Crestview's number in the playoffs. Uh, Crestview had a couple games where they were ahead in the fourth quarter, and uh, the last drive of the game, McComb came away with the victory. But then last year, the quarterback, Penix, got hurt on the first play. This year, after four rushes, Braxton Leith went down. Not excuses, because McComb, they come at you, and they were up 24 nothing before the Knights knew what hit them. And that was sort of the same song, second verse, uh, as the same as last year. So, uh, McComb, uh, you know what you're getting. Getting, and you better put your chin strap on and have it tight because they're they're bringing it and and obviously Liberty Benton one and one Macomb two and zero Liberty Benton won this game last year forty four twenty two so uh, I know Coach Algy uh, they're going to be ready to roll Nate I had Macomb in the playoffs last year against uh, LCC and they did not throw the ball once. Uh, just dominant on the line of scrimmage. That's kind of have to be the formula to beat Liberty Benton again, don't you think? Yeah, I and mean, you know this is a Macomb team that I think a lot of people thought we're going to take a step back this year, and we weren't going to see the same type of strength, maybe. And you know, and after week one, some of that was like, oh, maybe you know we were right. And they came in last week and they said, no, we are, we are still this team. We are still physical. We still know how to win and get after it. And you know, I think. There's really no reason to think that they're going to get away from that uh, for Liberty Benton. Liberty Benton kind of coming off of the opposite, right? It looked like a really strong team in week one. It was really looking forward to that matchup against Columbus Grove. And then Columbus Grove just came out and blitzed them. And they didn't really know what hit them before they knew it. They're down big, game's over, and they're trying to figure out how all this happened. So, it, you know, it's, it's an interesting matchup coming into week three where you have a team that's getting back to kind of what people expected and a team that's trying to figure out, okay, are we week one or week two team? Mm-hmm. I, I went. I looked at the BVC stats this week, and I looked again, and then I looked again because it says Braden Schaup has carried the ball 53 times in two football games. Yeah. And his running back mate, quarterback, Grady Schrader, he's carried it 34 times. And I thought, that can't be right. I kept going back and looking at the stats. That's right. Those two guys have 87 carries between them in the first two. And then you wonder why they, did, they pound you on the ground and average, you know, what they've, they've rushed the ball for 362 yards on the season. Ooh. They just keep coming yeah. at you and yeah. coming at you and coming at you. Liberty Ben, they, they've got a good running back in Elkert. Okay, he's got 24 carries for 186. Lieb is having a pretty good year, 31 for 44. But do they have enough offensive weapons to compete against a, a McComb team that gives up only 92 yards total on the ground in two football games? Well, Andy Cole's defense coordinator at Columbus Grove, what he did last week against Seth Elkert, the unbelievable receiver for mm-hmm. Liberty Benton, he said, you know what, we're going to double him. And so uh, Liberty Benton didn't move him around. He's set up in the same spot every time. Mark, how do you, uh, if you have a guy that's going to get doubled, how do you alleviate that? Well, what you got to do is, is, I think Coach Wireman talked about it a little while ago when he was in here. You got to be able to have option number two. And, and obviously, you don't want to forget about your prime guy. But if he's going to take two people, that's got to leave somebody else open somewhere else on the field. You got to use that. Or you got to make your running game go because you've got two guys out on a wide out somewhere. That takes a couple guys out of the box. So, you know, a lot of different options to do it. And it's good coaching staff at Liberty Bend. They'll have some things figured out. In the last six meetings between these two teams, each team's won three times, yep. and the winning team has scored at least 31 points in each of those six games. So look for it to be a high-scoring football game. Yeah, contrast of styles, right? Running the football, and then Liberty Benton wants to sling it around. Lieb's going to have to have a really big night at quarterback for Liberty Benton. Let's move on to game number six. It's a Saturday game. Carry at LCC. Danny Holbrook. And our own Kelsey Beimer going to yep. do her first ever yeah. game as a color analyst. Uh, guys, let's start with that first and foremost. Any advice for Kelsey Beimer? Well, you're sure. working with Holbrook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So right away, right. Uh, okay. Good, good luck getting a word in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if he says, are you kidding me, don't answer that question. <laughs> All great advice, Kelsey. Yeah. All right, so this is a Kerry team that, whoa, what's going on? 0-2, oh, right? This is not what we're used to seeing with Kerry and LCC. Huge win in the Holy War last week at 1-1. Uh, and one. Nate, let's start with you. How do you see this one? Yeah, so I think it's a little bit of a sneaky game because, as you said, you 0-2 oh, Kerry, people are like, oh, this was 
two one-score games that they lost. Right. This is still a big physical team in Cary. And this Cary LCC game has really turned into a nice little rivalry over the years with LCC having to fill in their independent schedule. And I'm glad that they kept this one on when they moved into the NWC this year. So I think LCC is working through some things. You've seen that progression, right, from week one to week two. A really tough grind them out game. I think a lot of people were shocked that it was the defensive battle that it was. And if it wasn't for a missed kick right towards the end of the game, you know, that's a tie game game maybe moving into overtime at that mm-hmm. point um so lcc getting back to i think what works right you have brady parker and he's only going to get better but he's still a sophomore you have to lean on matthew quatman right mm-hmm. and they started to do that last week they they had gotten away from that in week one and i think that that cost them a, that game against a, a shawnee where they tried to do some other things and they got away from their identity they got back to that last week so I suspect we'll see a lot of the same things they're going to feed Matthew Quatman they Brady Parker going to be able to make some plays on the ground it's going to be whether or not the O and the D line are up to the physicality and the size of that carry team yeah Mark uh, uh, Quatman up to 34 carries 156 yards run the football with him throw deep to Cowens do you think that's a good formula for yeah LCC? I think that's a pretty good idea for them uh, the problem they have to deal with you don't want to go three and out against carry oh no because you go three and out and carry they're going to run the football this is a carry team that's been uh, eight and two back in the, in the COVID year of 20. Uh, they were 15 and one state champs in 21. They were 11 and one in 22. They were 10 and three a year ago. This is a talented football team, a talented program. And 0 and 2 right now, uncharacteristic for them. There are a couple of uh, one score losses. Uh, I would think that obviously LCC needs to defend the run up front and make them do something through the air. Yeah, you talk about those one score losses. Hope allowed in 27 22, Galleon 14 to 8. Uh, Dave, when you see a team with three guys in the backfield continuously, like Kerry, and you're watching film with your kids, how tough is it to? get them to look at it serious because they think it's like a Civil War offense. Civil War offense, and you got to play assignment football because you don't know where the ball is going with all three guys back there. But uh, 28-14 last year, Kerry wins this game. Now, I did feel like uh, LCC did a really good job of containing T.J. Wirtz last week uh, for Delphi St. John's and, and really – tried to keep him between the tackles and keep him in short yardage situations. And it's going to be another challenge for LCC. I think Coach Paldy's also going to be looking at and challenging his kids. Guys, we've been one and two. Nate mentioned this last week. One and two the last four years. Here's our chance to be two and one before we go into league play for the first time in a long time in the NWC. I think it's a great opportunity for LCC to step up and show that they can bring that toughness like they did last week for four quarters, staying consistent with that and put themselves in a position to win this football game. If they're able to stop that carry offense from grinding out the clock, EJ Jones' defensive end for them is going to have to be outstanding, and Caden Falky is going to have to be one of those guys that has 15-plus tackles. That's how they stop them on defense. It's going to be a heck of a matchup, guys. We had a heck of a schedule of six games. that it, it, It's going to be so much fun to watch watch all these football games on, on the TV, isn't it? You know what, Miles? We probably ought to get this out there, though. The original schedule said this game was at 4 p.m. It has been moved to 6 p.m. on Saturday evening. So a lot of schedules still say 4 p.m. If you're going to go watch the LCC carry, carry matchup at Lima Stadium, it's at 6 o'clock on Saturday night. You guys hear that sound? That, that was that, Kelsey, wasn't it? No, no, no. That, that, that's Danny trying to get on his phone real quick to push his flight back so he can cut more, a couple more hours at the table in Vegas. <laughs> well, no, and he's got the later start now. I thought he'd be a little upset because the Buckeyes kick off at 7.30, too. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, poor yeah. Danny. So much fun talking uh, football. Let's move over to uh, volleyball. Uh, Mark, you'll be at the Collida Pioneer Invitational. Um, unbelievable teams in this field. Allen East, Bath, the Delphus, St. John's, Fairview, Collida, Liberty, Benton, North Central, St. Mary's, and Wayne Trace. I know, Dave, you've seen some of these teams. Um, I saw Collida, and I was vastly impressed with Malia Romes. Mm. She is an unbelievable 6'3 player, going to go play at Rutgers. 6'3", and she plays all the way around. Absolutely mm. incredible. Mark, tell us a little bit about uh, what you're expecting on Saturday. Well, the top bracket, the top half of the bracket, is Kaleidos 4-1, North Central, Delphi St. John's, and Wayne Trace. All those teams either have a winning record or at 500, so that's going to be a real interesting to come out of that particular and get into the semifinals and into the finals. Uh, the bottom bracket has Liberty Benton, Allen East, Fairview, and Bath. And some of those teams have struggled a little bit, but Fairview is really, really good. You've seen Fairview this year. They're 2-1. and one. Liberty, uh, Alanis is 2-1. and one. 
Liberty Benton's a little bit uncharacteristically one in three, and so we'll see what type of progress they have made. That's going into the matches, of course, that will be played Wednesday or Thursday evening with those particular records. And then WSM will have those matches. We'll have the two semifinal matches and in the finals that will both all air on Sunday night. Yeah, this is a Fairview team you brought up. Allison Cholik does a great job with that program. But they graduated Kelly Kreitz, and she was just a player of everything yeah, last right. year. She played absolutely every position, was incredible at it. So for them to bounce back, that shows you that is just a program, right? It's a fantastic right. group. Yeah, a lot of people thought Fairview would be down this year, but I have them as undefeated. Is that what you have? Yeah, 5-0. and oh. Yeah, 5-0. and zero. So Fairview and Tenora, they are the favorites uh, in the GMC. And mm -hmm. Fairview, great opportunity on Saturday to keep building. A little surprising to see a Liberty Benton squad kind of struggling. Absolutely. This is a program that's been state, state tournament material. They, they've won state tournaments. They, girl, girls go on and play college ball. It, yes, it, it is unusual to see that. And, and we'll have to look when we get up there because I haven't really been able to, to track a lot of their information on them. Have they had people injured? Uh, have it just been through a tough spell right now? But have a chance to look at them on Saturday and see where the Liberty Benton Eagles are. Now, Dave, you've seen Wayne Trace. It, 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 did you call it – Spurtability, spunkability, what was the term that you gave me? I gave you the term spunkability, That's right. and that was for Liberty Center when they played against the Raiders, and the Raiders came away with a victory in that match a week ago Tuesday, and last night, uh, Paulding defeated uh, Wayne Trace in GMC opening night action, 3-1. to one. I've, I've been very impressed with the Wayne Trace, so that tells you what Paulding brought to the table last night, and getting that all-elusive first win is so huge if you want to give, get yourself in position to win a conference title. But the Raiders, uh, Lexi Moore, she's a middle hitter, does a great job, and there's somewhat of a discernible difference, and I know you can't you can't teach six foot, and that's what she brings to the table with agility, Lexi Moore, the junior. But there is a difference when she is in the front row and when she's not for the Raiders. They've got to figure some things out there. Uh, Nate, you and I saw that unbelievable Saturday at uh, Shawnee. We saw the difference in what a, a great setter will make for your team. To me, that's the most important position on the floor. What about you? Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, and, and I'm not nearly as versed in volleyball as you three. I don't see as, as much as you guys do. And, um, you know, but it's pretty clear, right? Like there are certain positions on the floor that you have to have, you know, skill at. You can't, you can get by maybe, you know, hiding people here or there or doing different things. But if you don't have somebody that can be consistent and that knows how, how to set up your, your offense, I mean, it, the name is there, right? Then you're really going to struggle. And I think that that's a, a piece that we see a lot of that, you know, in this area. And I think you're going to see a lot of it at, at the Invitational. The, the state was supposed to release the first volleyball poll today, right? Right. Yeah, then they come out and said, no, nah, we got a computer glitch and we can't do it. <laughs> so you know, the first poll will come out on the 10th next week, but we're kind of looking forward to that because this evening when I had a chance to highlight the teams in our area sure. that were ranked in the polls, we've got some really good teams around our area. That's because the computer's still uh, factoring in four divisions, not it's seven. Not, uh, yeah. well, there's the first hit go, right? First hit go. Jam landed by Dave Bowen. <laughs> yes. Nice job, Diamond Dave. Uh, <laughs> before we move on, Mark, I do want to have you highlight, okay, a double. When the ball is mm. set. Oh, boy. Right. It, oh, because, boy. This because guy was a former well, volleyball it's, official. It's different, Maybe he still it's is, different right. every single match, right? It is. The rule book says that when the ball comes to the receiver, first of all, not hit. On the first hit, you can hit it with both hands. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you can have two hits on, on the first hit. Second and third hit, the ball has to hit your hands at exactly the same time and be released at exactly the same time. If not, it's double contact. Now, the problem with that is every official has a different view of what yep. double contact is. And what you have to do, just like that baseball umpire who maybe calls the low strike or the high strike, you got to figure out today what you're going to get from your referee. Mm. And they, are, as long as the referee is consistent, and I think that's the thing that coaches want most, be consistent. If it's a double hit in the first set by that team, it's a double hit in the fifth set against that team, and call it consistently throughout the match. Whether you're going to be a tight official or a loose official, just be consistent with it. I like that. Consistency is the key, isn't it, Dave? It sure is. And in the four matches that I have called so far this season, that's what I have seen, the consistency. I've seen some coaches holding their, their hand yeah. up two yeah, hits, two right. hits, but right. then they bring it back down because the official just isn't calling it that particular night. Right. And the consistency is there. You live with it, and you, you tell your girls how to handle it and play through. Well, you mentioned the setter. The coaches with the good setters, they want that double hit called. Sure. Because their girl's not going <laughs> right, to do it. Right, right, And right. they want it called. And, and 
You know, some leagues, when you go to a Mac game, you go to a Shelby County League game, some of the Western Buckeye League games, you better be on your game as a setter or you're going to get called for double hits. Some other conferences may be perhaps a little bit loose. And All if right. you're a casual fan like me, you have no idea. You're like, what? <laughs> like, I was like, how, how, what do you mean they double hit? How do you yeah. possibly see that? If, like, it's, if you it's call crazy. traveling in the first quarter, you better call traveling <laughs> the rest of the game because well, the fans are going to let you know it. The same thing with double hits. Yeah, well, and you know what? That That's – consistency we've talked a lot about rules here lately you and I and a lot of different aspects of things we've been doing and it's in any sport all you want is consistency out of your official whether it's consistently bad or consistently good at least you know what you're getting yeah great points let's move on to Buckeye chatter guys I thought it'd be fun to play the good the bad the Buckeye I'm a big western fan right right so I'm gonna go around I'm gonna ask you what you thought was good and then we'll go around. What do you think was bad? And then who was the Buckeye on Saturday? It was a big win over Akron. You know, say what you will. It was a slow start, but still wound up being a good win over top of Akron. So we'll start with you, Mark. Uh, the good of Saturday's win. Well, I went with Jim Knowles, the defensive coordinator. Okay, he, they held him to six points, obviously. 177 total yards. Akron had just 2.8 yards per play. They were 4 of 16 on third down. They turned the ball over three times to score two touchdowns. I think the defensive coordinator needs a game ball for that one. I agree with you. 4 of 16 on third down. If they can keep that up, watch out. That would be unbelievable. They will be in a natty. Uh, Dave, what's your uh, good? Yeah, Mark gave you all the individual numbers. I'm going to give you one word. Defense. Mm Mm-hmm. It just was good. It was really good, and it should have been against Akron, and they were there from the get-go, and that allowed the slow offensive start to be bearable. <laughs> I like how you slowed down your yeah. speech. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll slow talk about that. Star. Mm, yes. All right, Nate, you're good. Uh, for me, it was Brandon Enos, uh, the new punt returner oh, yeah. for Ohio State. Yeah. It's been nice to see somebody go and get the punt and want the yardage. He had four He had four punts that he fielded for 40 yards. He's fighting for extra yards. It seems right. like it's just a matter of time before he breaks one, and that'll be the first time in, oh, I think, like a decade or more that Ohio mm. State had a punt return yeah. for a touchdown. Jalen Marshall. Yeah, I mean, you so it's nice to have we, – we talk about all the other skills and the specialties and all the things that are so good with this Ohio State team that get a lot of uh, attention. There, there are positions, though, that go underappreciated, and I think that's one of them. Mm-hmm. And he showed that that's a different – dynamic now for this team which is another weapon that we can go after because now you can't don't have to just worry about our receivers or the running back or quarterback we have another option now we have another threat back there waiting to field that ball a hey, great point by you I've always wondered we got great athletes at Ohio State and we kind of took the kicking game off for years yeah. right why not try to exploit uh, that athletic mismatch that we have so hopefully hopefully this is the year we either get a kickoff return or a punt return yeah. because it feels like it's been forever <laughs> hasn't it yeah I'm gonna agree with you guys on the defense um but I'm going to say the ability to run to the football. You know, Ryan Day has made no secret. They want to play the game the hardest of anyone in the nation. The defense was flying, absolutely flying around the field. And that was a tough scheme that Joe Moorhead was employing with all the RPOs, all the fakes, the two quarterback situation. And you, all of a sudden you could have been paralyzed, but they weren't. The guys were flying to the football. And what happened? Two turnovers for touchdowns, right? right? That's the secret right there. They always talked about last year, why couldn't they commit turnovers? Well, that was the thing. We weren't flying to the football. That's when you get that. Now, let's start with you, uh, uh, Dave. The bad part of the Ohio State team. I'm not panicking here. Again, it's it's a great win. uh, But new center, both guards were new. The offensive line didn't quite open up the holes, we thought, for the running game, and, and that, that's got to happen. That has got to happen. Now, again, I know it was pretty milk toast offense, but still, we've got to be able to break some things open, especially against Akron. So stay with me. I'll, I'll explain that one here in a second. Okay. What about you, Nate? So for me, it was Will Howard. Okay. Ooh, I, wow. I have not been sold on Will Howard as a quarterback you've been in the room with me as we've had these conversations, <laughs> yeah, Miles. Yeah. And I don't know if it's his fault. I don't know if it's Ryan Day's. I don't know where the fault lies. I have n- – if it's a strategy, as Danny tries to convince me all the time, I, I don't like this new strategy. We waited until mid-August to name our, our starter for a team that says national championship or bust. I don't see how that can happen on a team like Ohio State. Should name it earlier. You should, and if you have a five QB room and nobody has stood themselves out, then when they hit the floor, the field, 
they better put up 400 yards because the competition has been so great that we have the mm. greatest of all greats. Gotcha. And instead, this has taken so long uh, on a transfer that we went out to get to make this team more dynamic. And then that first half was not good. Yes, he finished with over 200 yards passing. Yes, he had three touchdowns. No interceptions. And no interceptions. But it did not look good. It did not look smooth. I was not happy with seeing the quarterback play out of that team in that first half for something that was, should be the centerpiece of a team. It's the most important position on the field. I think we need to point out that you're wearing a Syracuse hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, you miss hey, Kyle McCord, huh? Kyle look great, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, that bottle of champagne on his way to Columbus Can right I ask now. this question, Nate? If it wasn't accurate, if we were playing LSU like USC did, would we have named the quarterback earlier in the summer? That's I don't know, but question. I can tell you if we're playing LSU and he, goes, he has 17 completions for 228 yards and three touchdowns, Great game. Mm -hmm. Going against Akron mm -hmm. with all the skill mm -hmm. position he has around him, and that's all he could muster at it with a run game that was not very good. The O-line struggled. They, they had a hard time getting going. Thank you. You're making me feel good. I'm, I, I, listen, I've been a little doom and gloom about this season starting to begin with, and I don't like it. I love Ohio State. I, I, want, to enjoy what is, I want to enjoy what is happening. But listen, uh, we've had a lot of conversations about this, it, and I, I, I just have like this it, this pending doom feeling when we talk about Ohio State, and I'm, I'm not enjoying what I'm seeing. Let me ask you this question. First drive, good first play, right? Third down, we throw the tunnel screen to J.J. Smith, and, and he is going to go. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's going right. to be yeah, a touchdown, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? He drops it. Do we have a different perception of that first half? He scores right there. The game, oh, absolutely. Right. The uh, game's yeah. vastly different, right? I, I don't disagree with you, but it's also one of those things where you should – first a play on your first drive and your first three plays shouldn't dictate how the rest of the half goes. Mm. Okay. All right. I, I see your point. Mark the bad. Gee, I had Will Howard down. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I only had Will Howard down in the first half because I thought a fifth-year senior – with his experience level and the talent around him would perform better in the opening half than being, what was he, 10 for 21. Yeah. The, uh, he played better after that. He was 7 for 7 after that. They did score three touchdowns. He got better. I just was surprised at the slow start. That's all. His second half was and fantastic. I, I'm, yeah. I'm a Buckeye fan, not fanatic. So right. I, I can go to sleep if they lose, like, like some people know, I know who can't. And obviously didn't lose this game, but I just thought maybe he should have played better. I'll go to sleep. I won't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so go back to Dave, right? Yeah. You, you said we weren't able to run the football, right, early. I'm going to go to Chip Kelly first and foremost, right? Akron's advantage defensively, quick up front, right? Everybody thought they were going to be a 4-2-5 team. Well, they came out in an odd front. Every offensive line guy will tell you, trying to run against a double eagle front is extremely tough, especially when you're going to go side to side, right? Best thing to do against a quick defense that's small, let's run right at them and beat them up. I'm amazed every single year, offensive play callers, especially guys that never played on the line of scrimmage, they always want to go side to side. It's the toughest thing to do early in the year for an offensive lineman. Box them in. They're small. They're giving you a front you're not ready for. Okay, we'll punch you in the face and we'll go at you. So I, I say Chip Kelly, mm, bad mm. first couple quarters on you. Mm. Listen, I, I'm, I'm kind of a dumb guy, Miles, and you said a lot of things that I don't know. What, <laughs> I, I, I don't know anything what you just Nate, said. I'm just over but here you know, shaking my but head. You know yes, what I know yes. What's is that, that the, the helmets – belong to Ohio State and the other helmets belong to Akron and the helmets that belong to Ohio State should have picked up the helmets from Akron and moved them five yards so we could run the ball. <laughs> that's right. all I know. Right. Head on a hat. I yeah. mean that's all that that's right. we're not we're not talking about, you know, Ohio State, Alabama, LSU, USC, Michigan. We're talking about Ohio State, Akron in a off season where all the talk has been we have a $20 million roster. We've done all these. We've brought all these guys in. We bring in a new D coordinator. we got a new offensive genius. We have all these things. We play Akron to open the season. Right. We should have been able to come out in the first half and be ready. All this, and it was a huge win. Yeah. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, welcome to Ohio State fan. Let, let's, <laughs> let's move on to the Buckeye, in your opinion. Who was the best player for the Buckeyes in a win over Akron? Nate, let's start with you. Jeremiah Smith. Yep. Uh, he, oh. uh, I mean, it's a yeah. freshman in week one. All the hype. You saw the first drop. Got the jitters out of the right. way. Didn't bother him. Didn't rattle him. 
didn't you know a lot of players as a freshman you drop that you know you have a, a right. walk in touchdown would have been like oh no not him he's like great he lived up to all of the hype and then some he had a, a an amazing downfield catch he had two touchdowns I mean he did everything that you would need to do and he did it as a true freshman he, he caught the vertical from Will Howard to start the second half from that condensed look on the fade with one arm you didn't yes. notice it you didn't notice it because yes. it looks so natural but it, the db had his arm pinned and he's no big deal on catch yeah, it yeah he's e- gonna be easily yeah easily the best player on the field on saturday that's a good call he had two touchdowns that's a good one to go with dave who is the buckeye yeah jeremiah smith i echo what nate said and then one of the touchdown catches he created separation as well and you just don't see that out of the young guys typically but this is something We've heard all summer long his recruiting. He is the guy, and he lived up to the billing. Yeah, he was pretty good. Mark, who's the Buckeye? Well, I, stumble, I stumble pronouncing his name all the time. Lanth- Latham, Latham Ransom. Ransom. Yeah, I was, I, whatever. Nine tackles, fumble recovery, touchdown. Yeah. I thought he was a, a key defensive player. I was on a defense that played very, very well. I gave my award to him. Yeah, he's fantastic. It makes you wonder how we forgot about him at the end of last year because he was yeah. it was huge when he was out of uh, the Buckeye lineup, especially against Michigan, where Sonny Styles had to play uh, safety and then missed a big tackle against Michigan. So mm-hmm. he might have been the difference in that game. Um, great guys. I thought all years were fantastic. I'm going to go with Tyleek Williams, big number 91 inside. I'm not sure if you noticed this or not, but his hustle was amazing. He ran down an inside tunnel screen, ran 25 yards for a big fella inside. He was everywhere on the field. He is going to be a multi, multi millionaire soon next year because he's going to be a top 10 pick. He was so impressive. If they get that effort from a defensive tackle inside, Watch out! This defense is going to be super special. We live in a world of nil. He's he's in the, he's, he's, he's in the, he, we don't have to wait till the draft anymore. He, he's got money. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, let's move on to what's quickly becoming the most controversial segment of this podcast. Yeah, I'm talking about the Power Five. You're going to give us our top five football teams in Northwest Ohio. It doesn't have to be in order, guys. Just your top five. What do you think, Mark? Okay, well, when we did this for our very first podcast, I had Marion Local, St. Mary's, and Columbus Grove because I thought they would each win their league and each be a dominant team. Then I had a whole raft of teams in the middle I didn't know what to do with. That includes Coldwater, Minster, Ann, and Versailles, Bluffton, and I got a whole bunch of them in there. I'm going to put my fourth team as Wapak. I think they're still really, really good. And I have moved into the, into number five, the Lima Senior Spartans. Oh, nice. I was so impressed with how many athletes they had offensively, how the quarterback Hall can get the ball to him. You mentioned Boog Wilson when we began this particular thing. He had seven catches for 141 yards and a touchdown against Finley. He ran a kickoff back on a trick play that he just turned the motor on, and it was like, adios, I'll see you later. He was outstanding. He was their leading ball carrier, rusher, in the first game they played of the season. Wilson is outstanding. Lima Sr. plays Marion Harding this week. Marion Harding's one and one. Nobody else on their schedule has won a game yet. They're going to go into the Toledo City League, and they're going to run a table there. At the very worst, they're going to be 8-2, 9-1, maybe 10-0 going into the playoffs, hopefully get a seed, get a home game. I've moved Lima Senior up to number five. Yeah, I think if uh, if Lima Senior's not ten and zero, something has gone terribly, terribly wrong in this season. Yeah, yeah. City League in Toledo is a little bit rough. They should run the table again like they did last year. Dave, how about you? Your top five. Mark mentioned four of the five that I agree with: Marion Local, Wapak, Grove, and St. Mary's. Until somebody beats them, they're going to stay in my top five. That they were there last week, and I'm staying with Coldwater as well. I like I like what you said about Lima Senior and, and that game last Friday night. That was just a big, big monkey off the back for Lima Senior. And, and as you said, their schedule really plays well for them the rest of the way. So uh, they can really get up in there if, if somebody falters. And of course, we're going to have Marion Loco and Coldwater play each other and St. Mary's and Wapak play each other. But just some really good football programs in the area. And I like my top five. Yeah, we're all kind of thinking about the same type of teams right now. I mean, they're all we, there's a lot of good teams right now. A top is obviously Marion Local. That, that's an easy one. Columbus Grove as well uh, are my one and two. Uh, I have St. Mary's sitting at number three. I think what they've been able to do, uh, I have deemed this first four games their revenge tour. I, I think that that 0-4 start last mm-hmm. year left such a horrible taste in everybody's mouth that they have come out on a mission. Um, the, they're getting it done on the ground. 
they don't need to go to the air. They have, they have almost 750 total yards of offense in two games all on the ground. They, they are doing a tremendous job. Um, I'm with Mark. I, I, I went back and forth because of all the teams that are playing well. You know, the Minsters of Coldwaters for sales, um, you know, Bluffton with how they looked as well. Um, but I'm, I'm going with Lima Senior. I think that that win against Finley will look a lot better in about three weeks. I think when you, you see Lima Senior, or, or excuse me, Finley get into that NLL and, and oh, start playing some, some of the teams, mm -hmm. I think that, the, that this win against Finley will get a lot more respected and will really help Lima Senior out. They're playing very good. Bill Lawrence has done a fantastic job with them. Um, I'm, I am going a little different with my fifth though I, I think they're getting lost in the shuffle we talk about the Marion local 50 straight wins the longest current in the in the country somehow people are forgetting that the Waynesville Goshen Tigers have won 24 straight yeah, regular good season point. games really good point they they lost their coach we talked to him he moved on mm -hmm. but they didn't get a slouch in Coach Summers. No, all he has done no. is one, and he has gone into Waynesfield, and all they do is continue to win. They, they've they won their first two regular seasons. Like I said, 24 straight regular season wins. They're doing a great job. A big game this weekend against Upper Scioto Valley yeah. that will go a long way in deciding who wins that conference. Waynesfield, Goshen Tigers are my fifth team. All right. Uh, look, very similar to what you guys have. A Marion local, Wapak, St. Mary's, who I don't know if they'll ever throw a football forward ever again. <laughs> um, Columbus Grove is in there again. I had Liberty Benton last week and I got a lot of grief because I dropped a team that didn't lose and I put Liberty Benton in there so the, the people of Coldwater Chip Otten and everybody there I am sorry you guys are back in my power five <laughs> uh, you guys are in and uh, wow what a great group of five there guys and of course none of these programs are good without leadership right so I wanted to ask you guys this question because as a young coach, I remember like you're the dictator, right? You're the guy that this is going to be my way, only the highway. But as I got better as a coach and our teams got better, I turned it over to our kids. And you're, our kids were the ones that were leading the program. I, I was kind of like the CEO. And if we had problems, I'd bring the seniors in and we'd talk that way. My question to you guys, can you still be successful as a dictator type coach or do you have to have good internal leadership? I mean, it's it, you have to have good internal leadership. Even if you're a dictator coach, mm -hmm. you can still win as long as you still have good internal leadership. You, the, uh, programs do not survive without that type of leadership. The pro, they can't sustain. You may win, win a week or two, but you are not going to win long term without strong leadership on the inside. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, and I took that to another level. You said internal leadership, successful program. I think you can have a, a good year, but if you want to have a great program, right. you've got to have that consistency. And I'll just be honest, two things I want to go with. I look back to our state championship team at Crestview in 2014, Hoops Wise. Those kids, they led and they communicated. And we had a Cam Etzler. Basically, he could talk to us as coaches, adult to adult. And he's an 18-year-old kid. Right. And he could talk to his teammates like they were his best friends, which they were. And that is huge, that internal leadership, kids buying in and bringing it along. Now, the other area I went, Miles, is when you said internal leadership, I was going to say define this. Well, you explained what you wanted, but I'm also thinking board your school board to the administration. Oh, right. okay. I'm thinking your administration to the coaching staff. And I'm not saying protecting them, but quouching issues that don't need to be issues. Yeah, there are things that you got to go to your coach. You got to talk to them about, him or her about. But if it's just coming at you and you know what it really boils down to is playing time, I'm sorry, that's a coaching decision. That's what we're going to live with. Yeah. But... You talk about then coach to players and then player to player, and that's where you're going with. And, yeah, you need that internal leadership if you really want to go to that next level. I worked for a guy one time as an assistant, and uh, he came back from a meeting, and you could tell it wasn't a, a good meeting for him. And we're like, everything all right, coach? And he goes, there's some things you guys don't need to know. Exactly. Right, right. That's exactly. the head coach taking the, taking the bullet there. Yeah. Yeah, or the athletic director or the principal uh, because – they come at you, and if you don't think your head coach needs to know that, that's a decision you got to make, and it's going to make the coach and the players better uh, when you make that decision. Mark, you know, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with all this about leadership, but it doesn't have to be vocal leadership. Hmm. Your best player has to be your hardest worker in practice. If your best player shortcuts drills, 
if your best player doesn't run a line drill, full go. If your best player, or players, plural, is not bought into being the best player in practice they can be, it's easy for the rest of the guys to slack off a little bit too. And so I think it doesn't have to be a rah-rah cheerleader type guy, but your best players have to be leadership in practice as far as how they conduct themselves. In the locker room, how they conduct themselves, how they prepare for a practice, how they prepare for a game, what they do after a loss, how do they handle themselves. I think that's as, as much of a key as a vocal leader. Yeah, fantastic answers, guys. Um, wow, what a fun time this was. Mark Schein, Dave Bowen, Nate Garlock, thanks so much for being on the podcast. The three wise men, Kelsey Beimer, Nick Fraley, great job producing this as well. And we'll catch you guys for episode four next week.